Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Counterpoint Countercast. I'm Scott Stannis, one of the cartoonists here at Counterpoint. We have a new member to the stable. Is that what it's called? A stable of cartoonists? That would be called a cacophony of cartoonists, perhaps. <laughs> yes. So what we do is a rodeo. <laughs> yeah, it's a clown. It's a clown of cartoonists. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's good. I like that. I like that. Yeah, yeah somehow all of a sudden, like, yeah. It fits. Uh, Gary Varvel was the uh, editorial cartoonist at the Indianapolis News for 14 years. And then for 24 years, he was the cartoonist at the Indianapolis Star. Um, Gary is syndicated. He's just joined us recently. He comes from the right. And uh, Gary, thanks for joining us. Well, it's good to be here. Just a slight correction. I wasn't the editorial cartoonist at the News for 16 oh, years. Oh, right, you were staff. chief artist. I was a chief artist, yeah. So uh, you drew quips. The, so the cartoon, yeah. So the cartoonist at the Indianapolis News was a, a Jerry Barnett, who who was actually my mentor. I met him when I was seventeen years old, and that was when I got the the bug, uh, the uh, the dream to become an editorial cartoonist because he told me that I could be. Oh, that was so bizarre. I mean, I met him and he looked at my work and he said, "You are better at your age than I was at your age. I think if you want to do this, this this could happen, but it'd take a lot of work." And it only took me uh, 20 years to become the editorial cartoonist for the Indianapolis Star. I was rejected a lot. So I was an overnight 20 year success, I guess. <laughs> Where all were you rejected? Uh, well, the Memphis Commercial Appeal, uh, the paper in Wichita, San Diego Union, no, San Diego, the Union. evening paper. Yeah. Oh, the Tribune. Yeah. Yeah, the evening newspaper, newspaper before they merged. Yeah. And uh, J.D. Crow got that job and then that and then they folded. So he was only there a short time before they folded. But uh, yeah, I, so I, that was another one. Um, and I interviewed for a job in, in the Columbus Dispatch, did not get that. And uh, so that was <laughs> that was OK. You know, I, I always say that that was the best and worst interview I'd ever had in my life. Why? Well, it was the it was the worst interview because uh, he he was talking to me, asking me questions and stuff, and he said, "Can I be honest with you?" Now, anytime you hear that, what's coming next is probably not good. Yes. And he, but he said, he said, "You draw better than most of the people who do this." But he said, "I don't detect any fire in the belly in you. I don't know what you're passionate about because it doesn't come through your work." And that's why it was the best interview that I had ever had, because that's I needed someone to tell me that. And so that actually changed me. That was probably 86, 1986. I had that interview. And uh, and, you know, so, some people would just give up, but that actually motivated me to figure out what I was doing wrong and get better at doing it. And, uh, you know, there's no schools for editorial cartoonists. Right. And. So you just have to deconstruct what everybody else is doing and figure out how, how are they doing it? How are they yeah. telling a story or, or conveying a message? And I guess I figured it out. It took me a while. Yeah, you did. Indeed, you did. Now, um, you're, you're a conservative cartoonist, that's fair to say. Yeah. Um, your politics, where did, I mean, where, where did that come from? How did that develop? Because you said this interview, the, the, the editor yeah. told you you didn't have a fire in the belly. You certainly have one now. So, yeah. so uh, what, how did your politics what happened? Evolve? Well, you know, that, and I like the, the word evolve in that, in that case, because uh, I grew up in a Christian home and uh, became a follower of Christ uh, early, but didn't really get committed to that until I was after, actually after I was married. And then, um, and that changed me just reading the Bible every day. That changed my views on a lot of stuff. Um, and it also solidified, you know, in the beginning, I wanted to do this, but then I thought, I'm not smart enough to know how to, I don't, I don't have the answers to anything. And so how do I know? What's my opinion any more than, valuable than somebody else's? Well, then when I started reading the Bible, then that actually changed my viewpoint that, hey, the Bible is pretty clear about these principles. And so now I can be more definitive about those kinds of things. And that, and it, and it changed me. So, I mean, you were a church attending family when you were younger? 
Yeah, you know, we were a little sporadic when I was when I was young, but then uh, when I became a young father, uh, 1984, that's when my wife and I got committed and said, "Hey, we're get, we got to get serious about this." And uh, and it it changed it changed me, but it also changed the home in which our kids were growing up in. How so? And I, well, you know, I think that we had a very I think very peaceful home, and if you don't have peace on the inside you're not going to have peace on the outside. Yeah. I mean, a lot of times I think people who uh, have pretty chaotic home lives and it's because probably the leaders in the family of parents don't have peace and they're, they're struggling. And then they cause this chaotic, um, this chaotic world around them. I think that kids who grow up in that, um, that becomes, they don't, they don't know anything different. So that becomes their nature. Our kids understood very early on that there is a God who created everything and that we serve him. And, and then because of the family structure, uh, I wasn't their friend when they were little, I was their dad. Now, as they have become adults themselves, we've become best friends. And I think that's the goal in life is that uh, we kept our kids close and uh, we trained them and until, you know, when they're young, their faith is really our faith. You know, they, we, they go to church because we take them to church. Sure. And we, but at some point, my faith became their faith. They, they developed their own relationship with Jesus Christ, and that changed them. And I think that our, you know, I had a conversation with a guy one time, and he has four sons. And he said, you know, I love my kids, but they, they've had some problems. You know, they've been in jail and. Oh. And, uh, and he said, I love them dearly. He said, but you know, the difference between me and your, your kids, my kids and your kids, you gave your kids Jesus. And I, I was kind of dumbfounded, but he's right. You know, we gave our kids Jesus and, and now, uh, you know, I know of some Christian homes where kids will fall away from the faith our, we are fortunate in our kids haven't, they're all adults. Now we have eight grandchildren. Uh, oh, in fact, we're babysitting for, we're babysitting four of them today, uh, so yeah, we've been very blessed, and I and I I don't take any credit on that uh, of myself. You know, I've asked I was asked recently, Scott. Somebody asked me, "What's the thing that you're most proud of?" You know, and I, I won a few national awards, not a bunch, but and that's nice. I, I was inducted into the Indiana Journalism Hall of Fame in nineteen oh. in uh, two thousand fifteen. That was cool. That was something completely unexpected. I was the third cartoonist that was uh, inducted. Uh, but the thing I'm most proud of, the thing that I, I'm most satisfied with is my kids turned out good. Um, that they're well, me, all faithfully following Christ. Go ahead. I mean, you obviously unapologetically uh, profess your faith, uh, yeah. not just in conversation, but also through your work. I mean, was that, was that ever a stumbling block for you? Was that ever a problem? Because we've, you know, as the yeah. secularization of America become grows and grows, uh, frankly, this kind of conversation doesn't happen as often as it should, in my view, and I think in probably in yours as well. Right. Um, it informs your, does it inform your politics as well? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I, I've had people push back. I get this, I get this a lot of times, Scott. People say, uh, Gary, you call yourself a Christian, and then you, you did this cartoon, da, 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 you know. Uh, in other words, hey, uh, the authorities that we have in, in in politics they're over us and and romans 13 says that we're supposed to respect the authorities and nah. but listen to this uh john the baptist went right at king herod who was the authority and criticized him for his lifestyle it cost him his head jesus told the pharisees you are of your father the devil he was a murderer from the beginning he was a liar <laughs> so that's pretty strong to you know, go right at the political leaders of that time. They were also the spiritual leaders. And he told them that you're, you're children of the devil. And that's pretty strong stuff. Wow. So I'm not saying I'm Jesus. I'm not saying I'm John the Baptist, but the Bible is full of like, for instance, the apostle Paul, the apostle Paul is the one who wrote Romans 13 and the Roman empire is in charge. And he writes Romans 13 and tells people they should submit to the authorities over them, pay your taxes, all of that, obey the laws. But he was in trouble with the authorities more than anyone else in the New Testament. He was brought before the courts he, because of his faith. And that's the drawing line. 
if you're standing up for biblical truth, then you're re- actually, in my opinion, you're required to go against the authority. Like, for instance, abortion. I will go, I will draw cartoons over and over against that because I think it is an evil that our country has perpetrated. 62 million children have been killed since 1973. And that, so I will draw against that all, all day long. Let me ask you something, because I've had this discussion with a, a theologian friend of mine and others, and I, it's, it's been an internal struggle of mine for years since I became a Christian myself. Um, but one of the things, obviously, that Christ teaches us, uh, and it says it's one of the new commandments, one of the two, is to treat your brothers as you treat yourself, to treat each other with compassion, right. with, with sympathy, and so on. Yeah. And that kind of flies in the face of what you and I do. Uh, in many mm-hmm. ways, is that we, you know, we're, we point and say the emperor has no clothes. In fact, he's naked. In fact, it's hilarious mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. here he, he, he's sure. naked. Um, how do you, I mean, how do you balance that in your mind and in your, in your theology? Because for me, it's a struggle. Um, it's yeah, not, sure. obviously, I've been doing this for 40 plus years, so it hasn't been a tough struggle, <laughs> but it's been a struggle. I've thought through that as well, Scott. And, you know, then again, I have to go see what does the Bible say about that? Yeah, we're supposed to love our neighbor as ourselves, for sure. But we also have to hate things that God hates, right? Mm. And the Bible tells us that, you know, that God does hate certain things. He hates sin, for instance. So uh, look at the, like, uh, uh, the prophets of Baal. Elijah challenges them, says, let's put up an altar. Let's put wood on it. In fact, let's, you know, and I want you to call down fire from heaven from your god let's see if he can do it and then he mocks them you know when they can't do it and they're chanting and they can't get it done and he mocks them he, in fact he says well maybe maybe he's using the bathroom and he can't he can't come right now maybe just got to <laughs> shout louder and then finally when it was his turn he said pour water on the wood and then he told him pour more water and, and so there was like water all around the thing and then he asked god to to devour it with the fire from heaven and he does he was which verified that he was in the right what he did was right in the eyes of god uh there i see a lot of things happening in our country that are just flat out evil and our country is in danger i believe of judgment from god uh and he's been very patient but i can see what's happening today as being, uh, we, we are following the pattern of Israel in the past in which they turned their back on God and then God brought judgment against the nation of Israel now, more than once. And now we are not Israel, but uh, our country was founded on biblical principles. I mean, you, you have to be ignorant to not look at the founding fathers and what they said in their, in their speeches and their writings and not see that they all believed that there was a creator God and that this nation was founded on those biblical principles. Up until 1900, uh, the, even though the whole nation was not Christian, they still believed in biblical morality. So for instance, uh, in the 19, early 1900s, you would have never seen a parade of people talking about their sexuality that just would never have happened then. Now it's a very commonplace now, but that just didn't happen then. Why? Not because they were all Christian, but because they had biblical principles. Now, I just recently wrote in my newsletter a series called Seven Men Who Rule the World from the Grave. And it's built, it's based on a book mm-hmm. written by Dave Brees, who was a pastor and author. And he wrote the book in 1990. And I thought, let's let's update that. But seven men who rule the world from the grave. And those men are Charles Darwin, Karl Marx, a guy named Julius Wellhausen, which I was not familiar with, but he is actually the uh, the father of liberal Christianity. It was that the Bible, you know, some of the parts are true, some of it's not. You know, you just kind of pick and choose what you want. And so that, and then um, um, Sigmund Freud, John Dewey, who in my ca- in my opinion ruined the educational system in this country. And uh, Soren Kierkegaard, and the last one is John Maynard Keynes. And Keynesian economics is what we basically have today, but it's affected the whole world. But Keynesian economics 
is the principle that it started off as in order to get the economy going, the government just needs to put money into it so that the uh, businesses yeah. have cash and then they can hire people and if more people are employed, then they can, then they'll have more money to spend. And that's, you kind of jumpstart the economy that way. Uh, somebody asked him one time, okay, John, this seems to work in the short term, but what about the long term? Now, this is John Maynard Keynes's quote. In the long term, we're all dead. <laughs> so the problem is, is that you're leaving <laughs> this debt that continues to pile up for future generations to try to deal with. And you're, they, so they, in order to try to solve a short term or a near term problem, they're making huge problems for the future. And it also becomes the principle which we have today that government is God. G.K. Chesterton said that if you remove God from the culture, you make government God. And that's what we've done. Yeah. I, I, you and I are, are agree on this one. I want to move on and talk about, you were okay. at the uh, Indianapolis Star for 24 years. Yeah, uh, yeah. Now, and you was you took did you take the buyout or what how did that yeah or did they say gary you got no. a minute <laughs> no. no they uh they just a warning to buyout. anyone out there if yeah. your boss sticks their head in your office or at your desk and says <laughs> you got a minute you tell them no no i do not <laughs> that's a very good point no uh i had actually you know, this is interesting i had a conversation with a guy a week before who had formerly been my editor and I, and I asked him, I said, do you think they would pay me to leave? <laughs> he said, no. He said, that's not a, because we were owned by Gannett. He said, that's, an, that's, a, a, that's a corporate decision. That's not a local newspaper. Can't do that. And uh, I said, okay. I said, well, they'll have to fire me then because uh, then I get severance pay. But uh, the following week, I literally, this is amazing. The following week, they offered a buyout. And I just saw that as an answer to prayer because I, I was, it was time for me to go. I was ready to go. Uh, they had offered it a couple of years before that, and I didn't take it because at the time I was 58. And I thought, I don't know what I'd do, you know. And then, it, and I still, I, when I left, I really wasn't sure exactly what I was going to do. But I, I've been very, very surprised. And I shouldn't be surprised, but, uh, you know, I'd always said that God is my provision, but he provided the star to provide for me, right? But now that I'm on my own, I'm literally God is my provision. I don't know where it's going to come from. And, but, you know, he's been faithful. And go ahead. Well, I said we talked about that earlier before we started recording the, the, this, this yeah. podcast. And, um, I mean, you, you said things are going great right now. I mean, you've, you've diversified. Oh, yeah. You have the newsletter. First of all, I want you to tell people how they, and we'll touch on this again at the end, but yeah. also how they can subscribe to that. Um, how have you been monetizing your life going forward? Because no newspapers. Yeah. Are you, you're syndicated? I'm syndicated through Creator Syndicate, yeah. And, that, and that's done well. You know, considering the newspapers uh, struggle these days, uh, and so it's, it's gone a little south. I, I, in fact, a few weeks, uh, a couple of months ago, I lost 14 papers in one day. Uh, nice. There was a new, Yikes. It was a, small, it was a small newspaper chain in Indiana uh, that they, they got a new CEO, and he told all the newspapers he didn't want me in the newspaper anymore. So I lost all of those. And that's, but that, and some of them I had been in those newspapers for over 20 years. Wow. So it was, wow. it was a little disappointing, but at the same time, um, you know, that's, that's life. I, I get it. I understand it. But, and so I wasn't that upset about but it. You're really but, blessed. You're really blessed to have been to work for your effectively your hometown paper, which is oh yeah amazing. I mean, I, I'm very jealous of guys amazing. like you, um, Borgman who was in Cincinnati for, you know, a century and a half, uh, yeah. uh, uh, Dave Fitzsimmons down in Tucson. I mean, mm -hmm. that's a special privilege and a special joy to work in your hometown paper. It was. And for one thing, I knew uh, the history of the state and especially Indian Indianapolis. And I had, and because I, you know, it took me a while to get the job at the Indianapolis Star. So for all of those years, I was working at the Indianapolis News. I was developing relationships with uh, reporters. And, and so they were giving me all. In fact, I still have a retired reporter who calls me probably once a month and, and just kicks around stuff. Uh, you know, he's thinking and he tells me about history of things that happened back in the 60s that, you know, connect with what happened today, which I would have never know. Sure. And newspapers, I think, have lost that type of um, uh, that knowledge 
you know, that that comes with people being there a long time. Well, and also, but any, go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. But I was just going to say that. Um, so, yeah, when the opportunity came in 1994, um, the editorial cartoonist for the Indianapolis Star was a guy named Charlie Warner. And Charlie Warner was one of the founding members of the AAEC. Uh, and he won the Pulitzer Prize in 1939 when he was at a paper in Oklahoma. But he spent 47 years at the Indianapolis Star. And wow. he took retirement at age 86. And so uh, <laughs> I applied and uh, I was fortunate because I, uh, I, I had been rejected so many times, Scott, that I didn't think I was going to get this job. I, that's, I just, I, I just, it was a dream that I just didn't think would ever be fulfilled. Do you know who else was up for that job at the time? I know a couple of people. Why? Do you I'm, know? Just cur- I'm just curious. Uh, no, I don't, I don't know. I don't want to say names, but I really, it's been a long time. I think it's okay. All right. Well, I, I thought that I heard that Dick Wright had, uh, contacted them. He might've been a little more expensive than they wanted to pay, but I don't know. And I came a little cheaper when I I was in house, when I came, but I heard, I, I heard there were 30 people who wanted that job. Uh, one of them, one of them from California and the editor told me, wasn't me, was it? I don't know. I don't know. You tell me. But I don't think he so. said he said that um, he said, you know, I don't know how people found out about it. Well, I know how people found out about it. I mean, you know, just the grapevine. But um, yeah, he called me. I they had interviewed three people and I don't know who to this day. I don't know who those people were. And then I thought I was in the same building. Star and the news were in the same building, same publisher. And what would you think? They're, they've interviewed three people and I'm right down the hall. They haven't interviewed me. So I thought, oh, well, I'm not going to get this. Yeah. And so I took a vacation, just a staycation. I just need to get out of the building and, and, you know, throw my own little pity party. And it was, I still remember it was a Tuesday uh, morning. I get a phone call and it's uh, Jerry List, the editor of the Indianapolis star. And he offered me the job on the phone. Wow. Wow. And I, I asked him later, I said, I'm curious, you know, no interview. And he said, Gary, been looking at your work for 16 years in the Indianapolis News. I've talked with you in the hallway before. I knew what kind of person you were, and I knew you'd be a good fit in this department. I didn't know that, but uh, so I was, it was, it was actually, to me, it was, it was a God thing. It wasn't that I had. Why the three, away with my, why the three other guys that they just feel they had to fly, like, go through the motions you know, they, I, I don't know you HR know, I, rules or something I, I think maybe they probably had to at least go through the motions okay i think i was probably in the bag the whole time that he wanted me but he didn't i didn't know that and so <laughs> i think you know to, to make it fair he did at least talk to other people when i got the job in chicago and that eventually it only took nine years but they, they eventually <laughs> gave it to me and we went out to dinner with the editorial page editor and the deputy editorial page editor and they said hey so you want to know who else we interviewed i go no it'd be like you're It'd be like your wife saying, you want me to tell you about my old boyfriends? You're going, no, <laughs> yeah, right. I don't want to know. And they kept right. telling me, they kept talking about it. And it was just, it was just like, <laughs> I don't want to hear this. Stop it. They, they never told me who, who the other people were. So uh, that's a good thing. Well, that was a blessing for them. It was obviously the right, the right choice. So since you've left, what have you been up to? So um, still doing the syndication. So I still do four a week. I've also started a new feature. It's been hard to get going called Humor Me. And it's a captionless cartoon. I know you did them when you're in Chicago. It's just a captionless cartoon. The only thing that makes this different, Steve Breen does one, uh, but the people, I think, email their uh, submissions to him and then he picks a winner. Uh, I don't want to deal with that. So what we're offering is that the paper does their own thing they pick their own winner and i don't ever see the winners and so uh, you know i just do the cartoon here's the scenario here's the caption that's empty and you guys you know the readers fill it in so it's interactive it's like you did in chicago yeah how does and i did well it's not selling too much yet i've got i got a couple of papers but uh uh I had one for that last for a long time and the editor left that newspaper. It was in uh, Connecticut. And, um, and anyway, uh, he, um, when he left, he didn't take me with them and they didn't keep me after that. Cause I think nobody else wanted to do, read all the captions that come yeah. in and pick the winner. That's a, that's a hard thing, you know, but if you want to interact with the readers, yes. it's a good thing to do. 
Exactly. And so uh, I do post it in my newsletter and I have people who submit, you know, cat uh, captions. Uh, the one thing I do is, so I have a free newsletter. You can go to GaryVarvel.com and sign up for free, GaryVarvel.com. And Varvel's like Marvel, except with a V. Uh, but you can go there and sign up and then that runs on Wednesday. But on Tuesday and Friday, I have two other uh, versions of it. So uh, the caption, I'll, I'll, I'll do the, the Humor Me cartoon on Wednesday, but the caption, the winning captions are on Friday and you have to subscribe. You have to pay me <laughs> to see those. And I've got a few subscribers, you know, people who like to you know, play the game. Anyway, so that I write about that kind of stuff. So I, you get all the, car, if you pay me, you get every cartoon I draw. Plus you get videos of the drawing process because I draw on uh, an iPad Pro using Procreate and it yeah. records the video. And so they get that as well. I also include links to conservative commentary that I thought was inspiring to me that week as well. So it's a lot of stuff. And then also I, I, I include in there my store page. So I have a book out called Drawing the Right Way. If you haven't got that, you need that. And it's not drawing, it's not a, a tutorial on how to draw. It's people who think the right way, conservatives. It's a, it's a conservative cartoonist view of the world is what it's called, but drawing the right way. I also have prints of my work that people can buy. T-shirts, uh, if people want those as well. And I have Christmas cards. So I had, I've done for years, I've done, Chris, I've done cartoons of, um, for Christmas day. I did a series of dual image cartoons and uh, so it looks like, uh, you know, a manger scene, but it also makes the face of Christ. And I've done those. And so those are Christmas cards as well. And, and so people can buy those if you still send Christmas cards. So what's your work week like? I mean, do you work? I, I, I try to take Saturdays off. That's pretty much it. <laughs> How about you? Yeah. I try to take Sundays off. Of course. But so I try to work six days a week and it's, and sometimes you know, I try to work in, um, family time, obviously. And we, you know, so my wife babysits our grandkids a few times a week. And so the grandkids are here, but at the same time, I just find times when I've just got to crap, you know, get busy. And here's the other thing I'm, a, I've always been a night owl. And so a lot of times when everybody goes to bed, you know, my wife goes to bed, that's when I, I get pretty productive. Why do you think that is? Because I am too. And a lot of cartoonists are, you know, and counterpoint. In fact, yeah. we're having, for those of you unfamiliar, and you would be with what the internal workings of, of counterpoint, we've had a bit of a row because so many of the cartoonists like working till literally, like some of them will file at four or five in the morning. I know. Yeah. Is that but you? I, I, no, no, no. I, I haven't done that, that yet. Bad. I, I'm, I'm the new guy, so I try to get in early as I can. So uh, I think part of it is maybe two things for me. One, I'm easily distracted. I see something, I'm like, you know, squirrel, you know, <laughs> but I'm very easily distracted. And when it's dark, it's almost like a blanket around you. You know, I'm in a dark room looking at a screen and, and it seems like I, I, I get cleared up you know it seems like all of a sudden you know i get these thoughts and then they start i start working on stuff and now they now at that point though then i start fighting sleep so you know I, i'm doing that uh, but you know as the older i've gotten scott i i don't need to i don't know about you but i don't require as much sleep as i used to five six hours is that's plenty. Oh wow no i actually found that i need the eight i need the solid eight now it used to be oh, yeah I, you know, like you, I would wait till the kids and my wife would go to bed because of the a you want to spend time with them because that's yeah. essential. But two, uh, just like it's it's such a distraction. Even if even if I have the door closed, you know, and the kids understood yeah. that if I was working or if I was if the door was closed, you don't bother dad. Janine apparently never got the memo. <laughs> my <laughs> wife, because even to this day, yeah. you can't see it now. But I finally ended up buying a on the air sign that flashes. Uh, <laughs> let her know don't come in because i've recorded i've That's recorded good. a countercast where she comes stumbling and saying what do you think of these tiles i was like i don't know let's ask the people that's good that's good <laughs> so, i like that uh you know i've been married 40 years so so far still working out okay um 41 but, for me congratulations oh, congratulations to you too yeah it's great yeah, isn't thanks. it yeah, it does just it does fantastic. get better I, it's, it's the, it does absolutely thing. i wish people knew that uh yeah it does get better well, I keep telling I people, it. I have friends I was, who like, I, go ahead, you go ahead. I was just going to say, I was fortunate I got the right one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, where'd you guys meet? Must have been college. 
Well, you know, I actually, the first time I ever saw her was she was 12 and I was 15. And, uh, and then uh, we dated one, once or twice when she was a freshman in high school, I was a senior. Uh, and then when she was a junior, we started dating. We didn't date anybody else after that. She was a junior in high school. Yeah. She was a junior in high school. And, uh, and then, so we got married in 1980. Oh yeah. We got married in uh, 81. So yeah, Janine and I met in college, you know, this is uh, beside that, but it really has been a a blessing, but it's so funny. I was just about to say, how many of your friends have come to you and say, we're going to get a divorce. We're having serious problems. And you just go, well, what's the problem? He says, well, we fell out of love. That's yeah. marriage. I mean, the yeah. one, but there are times, so, a, I always quote this line real quick from um, a movie called The Four Seasons. It's Alan Alda, Carol, um, yeah. Carol Burnett and others. It's a little long. But his friend says the same thing. We fell out of love. And he says, and it, Alan Alda explains to him what marriage is. And marriage is, you can't, there are times when you can't stand the way the other person breathes. Yeah. And yeah. then there are times when she walks in the room and she takes your breath away. Right. That's I good. Think that's just the perfect. That's a, that's a good line. And yeah. You know, so, so I, I've taught uh, an adult Sunday school class for young married couples and then we all got old together. But uh, so I did that for 23 years and you get to know the Bible pretty well when you have to teach it, you know, and so you have to study it a lot, but I used to teach these young married couples and I realized that, you know, they, they, they don't call the seven year itch, the seven year itch for nothing because you know usually that's when the uh life gets kind of normal and they all of a sudden they're, they're just you know they're, your spouse is a fixture in the home and it's not you don't have that eros love you know that erotic love that you had in the beginning but i i try to you know i learned this a long time ago that feelings follow actions that if you do things for your you you will tend to love the thing that you do the most for or the person you do the most for so the uh, the principle is the same thing as in the movie the fire fireproof that was produced by the kendrick brothers years ago and they did and one of the things they offered in that that movie part of the merchandise was a love dare book and the love dare book was 40 days of this is what you do for your spouse don't tell them that you're doing stuff for them just do these things and it's a whole series of bunch of stuff that makes sense and it's just spending more than more than anything else. It's just showing your spouse that you care about them by showing you giving them your time and you're doing things specifically for them, telling them certain things that they need to hear and your feelings will change. There's an old story about Dr. Crane, true story in Illinois. And uh, he uh, was also a lawyer. And so this lady comes to him and she says, I want to divorce my husband. But I don't don't want to just divorce him. I want to destroy him. I hate this man. He oh. says, well, here's what we do. Here's the idea. He said, it's going to take me a month to get the paperwork together. He said, in that month's time, I want you to shower him with love. You fix his favorite meals. You do all the stuff he wants to do. You just, give, you know, when he comes in the, in, the, in the room, you know, you just make him feel like he's the most important thing. Then at the end of the month, we'll serve papers on him. He won't see this coming. He'll be devastated. So at the end of the month, he calls the lady up, says, I got the paperwork ready. And she goes, ah, I don't think I want to go with it, go through with it. Why? He says, she goes, I don't know what it is, but he seems different. <laughs> well, he's different because he's got some, he's responding to someone different. You act different, then they respond differently. And it's hard to be nasty to somebody who's loving on you. And so it's not a guarantee that it'll change your spouse, but first of all, you have to change yourself. That's what, that's the biblical principle. You change yourself and now everybody responds to a different person. I, I know a pastor years ago and I was amazed at this guy because no matter what happens, he was like this. It was like Tony Dungy during a football game. Tony Dungy used to coach the Colts and when they won the Super Bowl last time and you, you he would, the, the team would get a penalty and you look, they'd, show him on the sideline and he was like this and then they score a touchdown and he was like this his, his expression never changed he was asked one time uh he was talking about his he had three sons uh one of them committed suicide but he said i'm most like my middle son he's the guy who gets kicked out of football games he's the one who gets the penalty for unsportsmanlike conduct and they said what how how can you be like him you're calm. He, he said, the difference was that was me. 
he said, I was the guy who went at all cost. And he said, the change was Christian maturity. As hmm. he matured as a Christian, he got control of his emotions and he didn't lash out whatever he felt on the inside. That goes back to what we was talking about at the very beginning. If you have peace on the inside, and the only way you have peace on the inside is to know the Prince of Peace. And well, I you walked us past, I was, had a great segue set up and then you-, you Oh, you I'm sorry, I kept going. <laughs> that's, that's all right. But you talked about movies and you are involved. Oh, with, now your son, who you say, you know, this, I, I'm not sure where he is in your birth order, but your son is involved in, in the movie yeah. industry now as well. Can you touch on that a little bit? And your involvement, you, you were, you've been involved in a yeah. couple of projects. Yeah, so uh, I, th- I have three kids. My daughter's a graphic designer for a newspaper in Indianapolis, uh, Indianapolis Business Journal. Uh, and then my two sons are both filmmakers and my two sons are both Grammy award winners. Thank you very much. Really? Congratulations. Uh, yeah. For yeah, what? Thank you. So, well, uh, Brett, when he was in college, directed a, a TV show and it won a regional Emmy in our region. That's so Ohio, Indiana, yeah, yeah. Michigan. And, uh, and then my youngest son, uh, Drew. So Brett's the oldest. Uh, he's the middle son, but middle child oldest son and then drew is the youngest son and he worked for a couple of tv stations as a videographer he was the creative director and they they did commercials for the on-air talent uh, one year he was working for a, a station here in indianapolis that was in charge of the colts coverage and so they did a lot of colts commercials anyway he won for one of his commercials so he won a grammy award for the best commercial. an emmy or a grammy uh, and Emmy, I'm sorry. That's right. Not Grammys. They both won Emmy Awards. Emmy Awards. Ah. Anyway, <laughs> awards. This agent thing is off. Awesome. I look really it? stupid in it. <laughs> no. no. Anyway, yeah. Not Grammys. They're not singers, but they do. They do sing a little bit. Anyway. Uh, so my oldest son, when he was in college, wanted to commit his life to doing Christian films, and so we wrote movies together. We did movie scripts together. We did a movie called The Board in 2009. And, and then we did another movie that's a full-length feature film. The first one was a short film, a full-length feature film in 2014 called The War Within. And The War Within won seven film festival awards. And uh, so, and we both act in it, but he co-wrote it with me. He directed and edited it and all of that kind of stuff. And then his, uh, his career has started to take off in the last year or so. He's directed movies. He directed a movie called Treasure Lies, which you can find streaming services around. I think it's on Prime. Uh, he just um, he just finished a movie and he can't talk about because it's a top secret, but in, in, out in Arizona. And he also did a movie called uh, Mayberry Man, which was shot here locally. And I'm in that movie. I'm actually the mayor of Mayberry. They needed... Uh, <laughs> They needed a, an extra, and I have one line in the movie. Okay, but, can, can uh, you tell Can you do the line for us? Uh, let's see. <laughs> I did this last year. Um, uh, Find your character. Get to your center. Yeah, I'm trying to get there. <laughs> it is, well, I'll just give the last line. It's, it is my honor to offer you the key to our fair city. And so I offer him the key to the city. And so wow. Brett, I felt like plays I was the there. Of, Brett plays the part of Chris Stone. And Chris Stone is a Hollywood actor who gets caught uh, speeding in Mayberry. And he gets sentenced to spend a week in Mayberry for the Mayberry Fest they have. They, and um, so they, be calling, they call him the Mayberry uh, He's the Mayberry man because he has to spend the week there. And it changes him being around all these people. And they have the, the idea came from the, the two brothers who made the movie. Their, their father was in uh, Andy Griffith's show. Oh. He had some. And so there's these reenactors, not tribute, they call them tribute artists. And the tribute artists are people who kind of look like the characters and they act like them. And they have, so like there'll be a Mayberry Days in, in Danville, Indiana, which is one of the places they do this. And that was my hometown. And so uh, these people come, to, you know, Barney and the, the, the mayor of Mayberry, the guy who looks like him and, and these different characters, the guy who plays Gomer. So they're in the movie and they actually reenact, you know, what it's like to be there. Cool. And what, happen, what happens to Brett's character is it changes him because there's a little bit of Mayberry in every one of us. 
Where so can, that was kind of a cool movie. Where can they see the film? You can see it. I believe it's on Amazon Prime. You also go to uh, to uh, Mayberry Man Movie and dot com. You can find it there. They are doing showings around the country, and you can also buy the DVD. And the DVD has fe- extra features on it as well. Yeah. And he got that part. It was interesting because they had uh, they had an actor from Hollywood set up to play the main character, and then the hit and the shutdown happened all over the country. And they, they had already committed themselves to make this movie. And so the, the actor uh, who was union, he canceled. So they were two weeks out from doing the movie. And so they kind of put out the word, we need an actor. Uh, my son's agent, who's in Hollywood, contacted him and said, hey, this is right down the street from you. Do you want to do this? And he says, yeah, it's my old hometown. Yeah, I'll do it. And so he, he did the audition and they, and they hired him uh, that same day. And wow, so cool. it was a last minute. And I think he was the perfect one for it. He did such a great job. So I'm pretty proud of his performance in that. And the other thing too, I wanted to say is that coming out on Christmas day is a movie called American underdog, uh, the Kurt Warner story. It's a movie about the hall of fame, um, uh, quarterback, Kurt yeah. Warner. Yeah. And he, he's a Christian. And uh, this is a movie that Brett is in. Brett plays the part of Steve Marauchi, who was the quarterback coach for the uh, Green Bay Packers and is the guy who fired Kurt Warner. Uh, they had Brett Favre, and they decided not to keep Kurt Warner, and they sent him packing. Uh, so Kurt ends up going to the Canadian Football League and makes a big you know, stir up there, and then they hired him back. He becomes the quarterback of the uh, St. Louis Rams, and they win the uh, the Super Bowl. Yeah. So oh, anyway, so Brett has really well. so Brett has a small part, but it's a it's a big movie, and it's coming out Christmas Day. So go see American Underdog and look for my son Brett. That's so cool. That's so cool. Listen, before we go, where can we see yes. your stuff besides Counterpoint? Which so you can follow me on Facebook. Subscribe to. Yes. Yes. Yes, and uh, so on Counterpoint, and then also GaryVarvel.com, get my newsletter. You can see my ar- some of my archives there. You can also follow me on Facebook. Uh, I don't do Twitter as much as I used to. It's a strange world on Twitter. I also do Gab, and I do MeWe. Wait, I'm sorry, what? I do Gab and MeWe. So these are other... Okay, that, that last one, I'm still, I'm hearing MeWe, which can't be, it's like, is that the French? <laughs> no, it's Twitter like me. Or... It's like me and we. Me, we. Me, we, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm going to sound like the old man I am. Huh? Are these real platforms or are you just making words up? No, these are real platforms. You can go look them up. And so, uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, so you know, I, I think maybe Gab started out as being a little more conservative. You know, it's like the conservative alternative for of Twitter, you know, and um and then MeWe is kind of the same thing in that uh, they they say that they won't like you know like uh, people were getting kind of throttled down on Facebook for instance yeah. Uh, yeah. and getting labels on their stuff. I get labels on my stuff on Facebook all the time, and I, my reach has started to shrink. I have twenty five thousand followers on Facebook, but if I post a cartoon, maybe a hundred or two see it. And then if it starts to get some traction, if they start sharing it, you know, so I'll get up there. I've had some cartoons that got up to like 6,000 shares. For me, that's a lot. 6,000 shares and my reach would be like maybe 200,000 people on Facebook. But that used to be a lot larger than that. I used to have like, I'd have weeks where I have like a one cartoon would get 700,000 views. And so I think I'm getting kind of, Oh yeah, no, no, no. Do do you also have a link to your someplace that takes them back to say GaryVarvel.com with you? Because if Facebook will shut that down, so will uh, Instagram. I mean, it's yeah. It's- Anytime I post on like LinkedIn is another place I put. Anytime I put, I always put GaryVarvel.com. I'm always trying to get people to come back to my sure. website and to find my stuff, and and then I try to promote my book as well, Drawing the Right Way, although it came out in 2019. There's still some great stuff in there, right? It become, they become history books, right, Scott? Uh, so, uh, and then, uh, so if you do look me up on Gary, uh, on Facebook or, or Gab or MeWe, look up The Gary Varvel. The? 
the Gary Varvel. The yeah. Gary Varvel. Okay, but the, but the primary place to go is GaryVarvel.com. And for those, just it's G A R Y V A R V E L. GaryVarvel.com. So do That's yourself right. a big favor. Gary, this has been great. Thank you. This has been. Well, thanks, uh, Scott. I appreciate it. And it's nice to talk about to cartoonists about stuff, uh, you know. So, where'd you get your ideas? <laughs> I hate that. I mean, I, mean I, I understand the question, but I don't. I, right. By the way, for 40 years I've been doing this, still no answer. I have no. I, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't have a good answer for them either. I will pray. I will meditate. I will read every paper on the planet. I will do every. But um, are you the same way, or do you just like. Uh, I am I'm exactly. I'm Matt exactly McNally wrote as, about it, and, and he said in, in, in uh, The Shoe one time, he said, you know, I stare at a blank piece of paper until beads of blood appear on my forehead. <laughs> That's, right. <laughs> That's right. And the, the greatest motivator for ideas is deadlines, right? Yeah, no yeah, problem. Oh, I'll wake yeah. up in the morning, have an, have an idea, say, okay, this is pretty good. And then yeah. over the course of the day, I go, this sucks. And then I'll yeah. start going through all the, I, I go through about three 300 different versions until if the deadline's at two o'clock at about one fifty-five, I go, you know what? That first idea was pretty good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I've done the same thing many times. And it's another thing too, is sometimes I think I don't know what's good because, uh, you know, it's the interesting thing about counterpoint because we kind of submit to one another, you know, here's, some, here's four sketches or three sketches. What do you yeah. think? And then a lot of times people pick the one that I didn't think was good. And then after I draw it, I think, oh, yeah, that was better than I thought it was. Uh, never send the, never send the bad, you know, if you send it, give them a choice. I found, and you know, this too, dealing with editors, never give them a choice to pick the bad one. Cause that's the one inevitably <laughs> they'll go for it. Right. 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 Hey, listen, we're gonna have to do this again. Uh, this has been a real, I would love it. Gary, thank you so it. much. And Thanks, um, Scott. we'll talk again soon. I'm Scott Stannis for Counterpoint Countercast. This is Gary Marvel, our latest addition to Counterpoint. And until next time, We'll see you in the funny papers.